Um, so as you know, services you can think of as everything you cannot drop on your foot. So water, electricity, education, healthcare, also things like television broadcasting, advertising. And so as you were saying, TISA is only 50 countries now, but country, the US has said they want to extend it to all WTO countries. That's 160 countries, including many developing countries. And it is being negotiated in secret. So what I'm saying today is based on the one leak we have had from WikiLeaks of the financial services text and news reports. So this trade and services agreement will be enforceable, we think, the way the WTO is or a free trade agreement. So if the European Union joins it and then Germany doesn't comply, the German government or the EU, I'm not sure which, could be sued at an international court, would lose and would have some kind of trade sanctions until it changes its law to comply. So it's very enforceable compared to an ILO convention or a human rights convention. If you violate those, nothing happens. But we think if you violate this one, it's some kind of trade sanctions. Maybe on German service companies operating in the US, kick them out of America or something. So where this goes beyond the WTO, GATS services rules, and even beyond TTIP in some areas, we can look at, for example, in the WTO, the services rules are only really binding on the national government. So it's not really binding on the Berlin City Council and you have provinces or regions, right? Not really binding on those. The, gov the national government has to try to make the Berlin City Council comply, but you know if they don't comply, it doesn't really matter. But we think that TISA will be strictly binding on all levels of government. So that means the national government and the European Union is making commitments on behalf of all the municipalities in Germany, all the provincial governments of whatever political party, which may be different to the one in power at the national level. So have they all been consulted? Have, do they know what's going on in the negotiations? Have they seen the text? Has every municipal government seen the text? Have they given their consent to be bound by TISA? I don't know. <laughs> so uh, this is something that is new beyond the WTO rules and could have implications for many countries that have these subnational governments. So um, of course you heard about the dangers of services liberalisation, which is what TISA will do, which means opening service sectors to foreign companies, because it means, for example, that if you privatise something and you need to renationalise it, remunicipalise it, you cannot if you've locked it in by opening it in TISA. So your electricity companies that you remunicipalized at the local level because the prices were too high or they weren't using renewable energy, you could not do that if you had locked in electricity as an open sector for foreign companies in TISA. And there was some discussion of positive list versus negative list. This is another area where TISA goes beyond the WTO rules. In the WTO, it's positive list, which means you list the service sectors you want to open to allow foreign companies. If you list banks, then Citibank can come here and open a branch. If you don't list banks, no foreign banks can come in unless you voluntarily open. In TISA, it's the opposite for one of them. Market access, you can come in on a positive list basis, but once they are here, they are treated the same as locals on a negative list basis. It means they get the same treatment as local German companies for everything unless you list it as an exception now, and you, all the other TISA countries have to agree to that exception, and you can't add any later. So all the new service sectors, like internet we didn't have how many years ago, automatically you have to give national treatment. So if you think about it in this financial crisis, I think you bailed out a bank, Commerce Bank, when it had trouble, right? If you had to give national treatment in banking, you would have to bail out any foreign banks in Germany that had trouble any Greek banks, any Cyprus banks, any American banks that were in trouble, you equally have to bail them out because you have to treat the foreign the same as the local. That's the kind of thing national treatment means. The same for subsidies. If you subsidise Deutsche Post public pensions, you have to subsidise FedEx's pensions. National treatment, right? Treat the foreign the same as the local. So all of those you would need to negotiate exceptions for if you don't want to give that treatment to foreigners. But there's more. <laughs> so uh, we think that in TISA there will be a standstill and a ratchet, 
which means it's one-way liberalisation. The government can open more sectors, but they can't go back and close it. So say you negotiate in TISA to open up 103 out of the 120 service sectors. And then a government comes in in Germany who opens 10 more. So 113 sectors are opened. Then you have another government comes in who wants to close them back down to the 103 that you locked in in TISA. They can't go backwards. You can only go to in the direction of more liberalisation. That's why they call it a ratchet. So there's a few other things that uh, we think will be in TISA that may be relevant for Germany and, of course, also for developing countries. One is your state-owned enterprises. I think you call them publicly funded companies, pub public funded institutions, like Deutsche Post, Deutsche Bahn. Yes. Which used to be publicly funded, okay. yeah. But but, so the definition is not clear, what would be a state-owned enterprise. Is it where the government owns 51% or where the government has a golden controlling voting share or something? But we think that there may be disciplines on the government restrictions, on the government assistance to state-owned enterprises in TISA, because the US doesn't like Chinese state-owned companies, and China is trying to join TISA. And the American companies say, we cannot compete with the Chinese state-owned companies who get government assistance in the form of cheaper loans or cheaper land or something. So if they put those disciplines in TISA, the way they are in the current US Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiations, in case China joins, then you will be collateral damage. And so they may have an exception, the way they are in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, for domestic services. Because otherwise your public hospitals, your public schools, your public universities, they're all government funded. What, no more government funding? So the negotiators realised, oh, we need an exception for that. But that's only domestic services. Deutsche Post is not domestic. It sends letters around the world. So those public pension subsidies, still not possible. Um, and other, for example, Airbus. It's not domestic services, it's manufacturing, right? They get subsidies. Would they be allowed under TISA? It depends if Airbus is considered state-owned, right? You know, how many voting shares do the various European governments have to qualify? Which one is it? Airbus. The e Airbus. 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 The Flugzeughersteller. Yeah. yeah. So if that is state-owned, could you continue to subsidise it? If you can't subsidise it, what happens to the jobs and so on? Uh, excuse me, to, to clarify that, why would Airbus fall under trade and services? It's a manufacturing. That's true. So uh, I was thinking of the TPP, which is a full free trade agreement in terms of disciplines on SOEs, but um, if they only discipline services SOEs, you're right, then only services SOEs that are exporting. Okay. So Deutsche Post. Deutsche Bahn, if the trains go outside Germany. They do. There you go. Uh, if you have German airlines anymore, no, right? Uh, airports, if the airports are state-owned, ports, those kinds of things are services, but they're not purely domestic. But the bus service within Berlin, that would be domestic, so that would be safe. You could still subsidise it. Yeah, you're right, services. So the last issue I wanted to cover for that might be relevant here is the financial services leak. So WikiLeaks leaked this a few months ago now, and I was quite surprised to see some things in there that looked to me like they could undermine the good financial re-regulation you have done since the financial crisis here in Germany. Because one of the things you did was you banned naked short selling, that particular type of trading, right, that has been causing some problems in the financial crisis. This, I think, would not be allowed under TISA unless you get an exception that all the TISA countries agree to, and even then you might be caught. Because if naked short selling is a financial service, then there is actually a European Union proposal that you cannot ban these financial services, these new financial services, unless it's for a prudential reason. And then the prudential reason has been agreed that it has one of these circular definitions. You can't use a prudential defence or exception to avoid your obligations. So then what's Could the point? Could you explain that, what that is? <laughs> yes. So this again is copying from the WTO rules, GATS, which says, yes, you can do financial regulation if it is for prudential reasons. But you cannot, do, you cannot call it prudential if you're using it as an excuse to avoid the rules, as a way of avoiding the rules that say you can't do financial <laughs> regulation. 
So the lawyers around the world have looked at this and the law professors disagree. Some think it's a useless defence, it doesn't work. Some think it might work. It's never been tested. But that's the one that is copied into the leaked financial services text. And that has been agreed by all the TISA countries, that flawed prudential defence. So would the German government agree to remove its ban on naked short selling if it, doesn't, if it is a financial service and it doesn't satisfy the defence? The second one that I know that you did, and all I know about German laws and policies is reading US government reports, and one of the other things they said that you did was in 2013, you have a new law saying that you have to separate out the risky trading from the deposit taking part of the bank so that the banks cannot gamble ordinary citizens' deposits on the stock market and lose them. This is a very sensible proposal. The US did it after the depression of the 1930s. It's called a firewall or Glass-Steagall, it was named in the US. <coughs> Again, it's not clear you could get an exception for this in TISA. And if you're relying on the prudential defence that we talked about for this, the WTO has already said that these kinds of firewalls separating the two types of banking probably would not satisfy the prudential defence because it can be seen as a way of keeping out the banks who like to mix up all the money. So it's a barrier to market access. So not prudential. Even though you did it for prudential reasons, it has a market access barrier effect, so it may not qualify as prudential. So if that's the case, have the German finance regulators, the German parliament all agreed to give this up in TISA? Really? Because, I mean, this is the EU proposal on your behalf. So I was quite surprised that this new law from one year ago, <laughs> you've already agreed to give up. But that's what it looks like when you see the text, when you know that how these things can be interpreted. At least that's what I think. And then, of course, if you combine this with TTIP, which I think you've been talking about, um, TTIP, for example, may prevent you from having a Tobin tax, a financial transactions tax, because the investment chapter is usually requires free movement of capital. So your financial regulation can be hit from multiple sides. Um, and the last part in the financial services leak was that um, the US is proposing that your sensitive financial data of German citizens, like, you know, how much is in your bank account, can be stored in the US, where we know the US government, thanks to Edward Snowden, we know the NSA goes and downloads it on a memory stick and they can sell the data to advertisers with no privacy safeguards. That is the US proposal in TISA, even after Snowden. They have no shame. Despite the new EU data directive plans and everything, they still want sensitive data of all EU citizens to flow to the US where they can download it, at least for finance. That's the one that's leaked, so that's the one we know. Um, and I guess you probably talked about certification when you were doing TTIP? No? Okay, never mind. We can discuss that because uh, that definitely applies to TTIP, will probably apply to TISA and would make it worse. It's a US process. We talked at length before you came about the secrecy surrounding all that and the lack of participation of, of the parliament. But let me ask you two more questions before we turn over to Martin. The one is, who is the pusher here to your analysis? Is this more the European Union? Is this more the US? And in conjunction with that, why are countries like South Korea, Turkey participating? I, I think you probably talked about Public Services International has a very good um, document about TISA. It might even be in German now, I think. Yeah. And they actually look at the history of how it started and how it was pushed by the multinational services companies. They wanted to be able to open bank branches in all kinds of countries to make more money. They weren't getting that through the WTO negotiations because they're a bit stuck, the Doha round. So they said, let's, the really good friends of services, really, that's what it's called, let's get together, a coalition of the willing, and have TISA for those countries who are willing to go further. Why are the developing countries there? I don't know. Some of them, like South Korea, already have a US free trade agreement. So maybe they think we've agreed to it all already, nothing new. Um, one country was in and came out, Singapore, but apparently they withdrew because they weren't getting enough market access, not for defensive reasons. Um, but most developing countries are not there because they recognise the risks to their policy space, to their ability to do financial regulation, to their ability to um, use services for local employment in affirmative action and so on. So it's the rare developing country who is in there. And when you look at them, 
They are countries like Chile, who is an OECD member, has free trade agreements with so many countries. Mexico is the same. Costa Rica was very, under the last government, very willing to sign trade agreements and open up sectors. So Panama, tax haven. So it's a funny group of developing countries. It's not Brazil, India, South Africa. China is trying to join because they have apparently in their new economic plan, they want to export more services. So they probably think they can through TISA. This brings me to my second question. You mentioned already that the US is very concerned about China joining because of the cheap competition. But why is the EU more favorable to the idea that China might join? Or is that a wrong perception? It seems to be that there was even a, a controversy between Washington and Brussels about China joining or not. Yeah, so I haven't been following closely, but all I know is that the EU wants this to be all WTO members. So they were trying to make it more palatable so that more countries could join. I think they want everybody in the tent. Um, and of course that would help European Union companies to export services to China, um, but also face competition from Chinese companies to Europe. So I'm but, not sure but the underlying reason. Obviously it seems like European multinationals and companies and governments are less concerned about overwhelming Chinese competition than the US companies and government is concerned. Is that correct? I actually also think that the US is probably trying to extract a high price for China's entry. That's typically what they do. If a country is trying to join a club that the US is in, like the WTO, and you're a, a late joining country, the WTO accession process, the US puts all kinds of demands, both trade and non-trade, non-economic. And the same for joining a US free trade agreement. You have to meet all these preconditions of all the trade policies you have that they don't like, that they've been attacking year after year that are legal under the WTO, but they don't like in their trade reports. So I suspect the US, just guessing, is trying to extract as high a price as they can. What is the laundry list of all the things they have ever wanted China to do? And say, China, okay, you have to fulfill all of these before you can join the club. Because that's the way the clubs work, like TISA. You can't come in until you get the permission of all the existing members and they can set any conditions they like. It's law of the jungle. They could say, I want you to change your prime minister. I don't like the color of his shirt. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be trade related. It doesn't have to be economic. And they just say, until you do it, I won't let you in. That's the way it works for the WTO, for TISA, for a free trade agreement.